I'm starting this video in Lake Jackson, Texas, and I've got a, a story for you about the hotel situation. But first I need to get some breakfast, and a little blue sign up ahead says there's a Bucky's at the next exit. There's something a little different about this Bucky's that none of the other locations have. There are 32 healing positions, and the convenience store building is about the size of a large racetrack or quick trip, but inside the building is something different from the other Bucky's. There's a coffee shop inside called, called Bucky's Beanery. Take a look at Bucky the Beaver on that sign. The little guy is wearing a chef's hat and he's so amped up on caffeine. Look at his eyes. Those pupils are so huge. This location is also a drive through I'm not sure if this is the only Bucky's location with a drive through but this drive through is busy here. You can't get the convenience store merchandise or beaver nuggets from a drive through but they do sell their coffees here, like lattes, cappuccinos, espresso, macchiatos, they also have a good selection of fraps and also iced coffees and sodas. They also sell their baked goods like kolaches, muffins, their awesome cinnamon rolls, and their breakfast tacos. They even have a small dog walking area where your puppy can do their business. Over here is a cute sign. Look at the bottom where it says, Attention Dogs. Grr, bark, wolf, good dog. At this location, they have one of their famous super huge car washes. I remember going to the world's largest car wash in the Katy, Texas Bucky's location. It's definitely an experience. We're getting our breakfast inside since we need some stuff from the convenience store. This is the front counter and looks like a typical coffee shop. Just like most other bookies, there are kiosks to order freshly made sandwiches, tacos, or coffee. There's Bucky the Beaver with the huge pupils again. This does kind of remind me of a Wawa, which is another convenience store chain. And like other Bucky's locations, they have grab and go sandwiches and cups of pudding. The breakfast food is like any other Bucky's, and it was good. The coffee was mad. I found much better coffee at McDonald's. But some good news, I did buy a special shirt here. I'll show you with that in just a minute. Hey guys, it's Emily. Welcome everyone! On this video, I'll focus on some cities either on the coast or near the coast of southeastern Texas. I'll check out some interesting roadside attractions, visit the very first Bucky's, and I'll tell you about a historic disaster that occurred at Texas City. But after the title sequence, I'll talk about my interesting hotel experience in Lake Jackson. Gonna be an interesting morning. Let's go! the interesting hotel experience from last night. When we got to the hotel, it was very dark, the lighting was very dim, and what I could see looked really run down. Also we noticed not many vehicles in the parking lot, but a couple of vehicles had people inside them. And the parking lot itself was very run down as well. In fact, the recent rains caused a puddle that was about the size of a small pool to form near the front of the building. It didn't look safe at all, so we went to another hotel a few miles away. But the hotel chain, not the hotel itself, but the chain, did refund our money. By the way, we also didn't know this, that this particular hotel asked for a $50 cash deposit and they apparently make up reasons to keep that deposit. So even though we paid d about double for the second hotel, it's much better to be safe than sorry. And with that, let's bring up a Google Earth animation to show you where Lake Jackson is. Lake Jackson, Texas is about an hour or so south of the city of Houston, but it's part of the gigantic Houston metropolitan area. This predominant industry is petrochemical, the population is about 28,000 people as of the 2020 census. 
The city was incorporated in 1944 as a planned community for workers of the Dow Chemical Club Company. We're only about 10 miles north of the Gulf of Mexico. The famous singer Selena and politicians Ron and Rand Paul are from Lake Jackson. Lake Jackson has a nice downtown area and looks like a good number of businesses like restaurants and boutique stores. There's also an H-E-B grocery store here. It's so early in the morning here, so not many people walking around. There are small markers embedded in the sidewalks in downtown, including this one that knows the buildings downtown reflect early modern architecture and bright colors. The city's original architect was Alden Dow, who planned the city with creativity and luxuries that can be enjoyed and afforded by the middle class. Dow was a pioneer in modern architecture in the 1940s. This community was also a pioneer using the latest materials and technology at the time, including air conditioning. He also wanted to integrate the architecture with nature. He wanted to preserve as many trees as possible. But what's really interesting are some of the road names. As I find myself in the corner of this way and that way. There are actual road names this way and that way. In fact, on the big green signs on the nearby expressway, there's an interchange with the road this way and it's so confusing because it looks like I should go this way to Lake Jackson. Now take a look at this. The intersection of this way, that way, and center way. I wonder who thought to use these names for the roads. Was it done as a joke? Do they want the road names as generic as possible? So I'll just keep going uh, this way to see what else I can find in Lake Jackson. Right next to me is this vintage British style red telephone box. I believe this is for decoration to add the quirkiness of this retro modern city. Now it's time to leave the downtown area and head to the very first Bucky's location, which is just a few miles from here. And here it is at the corner of Oyster Creek Drive and Angleton Drive where the cities of Lake Jackson and Clute meet. So what does the very first Bucky's look like? It looks a lot like a s small Circle K or 7-Eleven. Nothing like the big travel centers they're building now. Just eight healing positions here. Yep, just eight. The very first Bucky's opened in 1982 by Arch the III. Bucky's was inspired by his grandparents, Arch and May Applin, who owned a gas station in Harrisonburg, Louisiana. Arch Applin prepared by this small piece of land and opened this 3,000 square foot store, very modest by today's standards. But this is where Bucky's got to start. Applin's nickname was Beaver, and that combined with, with the name of his then dog, called Buck, and some inspiration from the mascot of the former Toothpaste Company all together became the familiar mascot Bucky the Beaver, wearing a red hat and placed on a circular field of yellow. The focus for Bucky's was selling cheap ice and keeping the restrooms clean, because that's what the customers wanted. That same concept still applies to every single Bucky's across the country. This is just a basic small convenience store. They sell beer, wine, soda, and other beverages, plus snacks and other items. They do have beaver nuggets here. Nothing fancy at all at this location, but it's the first one. It's not near any major highway, and only locals frequent this location, aside from the random Bucky's enthusiast such as myself. But you notice everything is very clean. Coffee and soda stations are clean, so are the gas pumps. 
And take my word for it, what are also spotless and clean are the restrooms. In this location, those restrooms are one stall for women and one stall for men. The special shirt I got at the other Bucky's location this morning. It says Lake Jackson, Texas, home of the original. And the location was the second location. It opened in 1985. Pretty awesome, I visited the first two Bucky's ever. Now in the nearby city of Angleton, this is Stephen F. Austin Munson Historical County Park. Yesterday I saw the ginormous statue of Sam Houston. Today I'm seeing a slightly less ginormous statue of another Texas founding father, Stephen Austin. Unfortunately, the visitor center is closed this morning, but that won't stop me from taking some quick pictures and video next to this giant statue. So here I am next to the base of the statue, which is not as big as Sam Houston's. But the statue is really tall and massive as well. It's just a little bit smaller than the Sam Houston statue. Just a little bit though. The platform doesn't look nearly as big as the platform that Sam Houston is standing on. But the statue plus the platform totals 76 feet in height. Just one foot shorter than Sam Houston. But the Sam Houston statue and this statue were sculpted by Texas artist David Adickies. Notice in his left hand, Stephen Austin is holding a very long rifle. That rifle is 52 feet long. Stephen Austin is considered the father of Texas. Since he played a pivotal role in Texas' independence from Mexico and helped to form the provisional government of the Republic of Texas. I feel like I know more about Texas history than I do about the history of my home state, Georgia. Maybe Georgia needs a giant statue of James Oglethorpe, who is the founder of the colony of Georgia. Anyway, Stephen Austin's statue is here because he's also a prominent figure in Rosoria County, where I am now. Stephen Austin passed away in 1836, just after the Republic of Texas was born. He's buried in the nearby city of West Columbia. He was just 43 years old when he passed away. I'm going to completely switch gears as we drive about an hour northeast to my next destination. I'm headed to Texas City, which is an extremely important city for gasoline production. Texas City and the nearby area refines about 4% of all gasoline used in the United States. One refinery operated by Marathon is the third largest refinery in the United States. The Port of Texas City is one of the busiest in the nation. I'm in the town of Hitchcock. Look at this sign going across the street. Hitchcock Proud. Here's a Google Earth animation to show where Texas City is. Texas City is lo located next to Galveston Bay that leads directly into the Gulf of Mexico. The city is also protected by a series of levees and a five mile long dike to protect against flooding and the occasional hurricane. Most notably, the system was credited with limiting the damage caused by Hurricane Ike in 2008. Now I'm on the main road that goes through the heart of Texas City production complex. It's unbelievable seeing all the power lines, pipelines, storage facilities, and I have to say it does smell like a gas station, even with all the car vents closed off to the outside air. The oil business started here in the early 1930s, and during World War II, this complex was critical for supplying petroleum as well as tin and synthetic rubber. After the war, this area contributed to the overall post-war economic boom. On April 16, 1947, a ship called the Grand Camp was docked to the port of Texas City and carried a large amount of ammonium nitrate fertilizer. The fertilizer overheated and eventually exploded. That explosion caused another explosion one day later of a nearby ship that also contained ammonium nitrate, 
the SS High Flyer. The ship ran the third ship, also containing fertilizer. The SS Wilson B. Keen. The ship also exploded. All the explosions cascaded to, a near to nearby oil tanks and refineries. The Texas City disaster killed 581 people and injured over 5,000. 2,000 people were left homeless. The first explosion produced a 15-foot tsunami and a shockwave which leveled over 1,000 buildings. The shockwave was felt over 100 miles away and it blew out windows in Houston, 40 miles away. Fiery debris rained down on Texas City for two days, causing widespread fires throughout the city. This occurred just two years after World War II ended, and the devastation brought back painful memories of air raids and even the dropping of the atomic bombs in Japan. To this day, it's considered the worst industrial accident in the U.S. history. The explosions threw a ship anchor and a propeller about a mile away, and another ship anchor went over 1.6 miles away. Let's check this out. Zooming in on the refinery complex as far as I can, I'm going to unzoom, and I want you to imagine a very large propeller from a ship that was blown all the way to here, about a mile away. There it is along the bike trail. Look at how massive this is. This came from a giant ship about a mile away. That's how forceful those explosions were. I have no idea how much this thing weighs, but it's really big. It has to be, I guess, about 15 or 20 feet tall. Anyway, this marker says this is the propeller from the SS High Flyer, which exploded in the main slip after being set on fire by the SS Grand Camp, which exploded in the north slip a day earlier. This memorial was dedicated on the 40th anniversary of the disaster. This marker gives an overview of the Texas City disasters, where three ships, all loaded with ammonium nitrate produced a series of explosions. It also says those widespread fires took several days to extinguish as firemen across the country came to help. As a result, new safety standards were implemented. And this is interesting. By 1950, just three years later, few physical reminders of the disaster remain. That's all really impressive. It took just three years to clean all that up. I read in my post research that the propeller was moved to this more accessible location as there were concerns about security after 9-11 where this propeller was originally located, but it still was flown about a mile due to the explosion, which tells you how forceful that explosion was. One more quick look at the refineries way down there. And then swing back around at this propeller monument. They did make a smaller platform and have two lamps next to it. Now at another vantage point, you see the propeller down the road. Now I'm going to unzoom and you'll see I'm at Rainbow Park along the same road. But look to the left. This is one of the ship anchors that flew over here during the explosion. The anchor was placed on a slab of concrete and painted with the design of the Texas state flag. After post research, I did find out this anchor weighs 10,000 pounds. And it flew a, a half a mile to this location during that explosion. There's a small marker. It says on April 16th, 1947, the French freighter Grand Camp exploded, which set off a, the Texas City disaster. This 10,640-pound anchor was found buried a half a mile from that explosion. According to this marker, the anchor was placed here and dedicated 15 years after the disaster. At the ceremony, they mentioned this is not to awaken long dead and dismal thoughts, but as a tribute to a great and growing me metropolis with a bright future.
This park where the anchor is the centerpiece is called the appropriately enough Anchor Park. There's a larger park behind that with a gazebo and a playground. That's Rainbow Park. I just noticed the white star on, on the blue background where Texas City is located in the state of Texas. This park is on Dyke Road, the same road where the propeller is. Here's a side view of the anchor, and look how thick that chain is. I'm not sure if the chain was attached to the anchor when it was on the ship, or if the chain was just used to bolt to the ground. I made it to one more memorial for the Texas City disaster. This features an object that flew over 1.6 miles from the explosion. I'm at a memorial park on 25th Avenue North, near 29th Street West. This is much more than a park, as you'll see. Here's another anchor from the explosion. This anchor is 3,200 pounds, but I'm now 1.6 miles from the explosion. This is a nice platform with the brick walls and stonework. Here's a small marker on the anchor. It says this anchor was blown from the SS Grand Camp when it blew up on April 16, 1947. The anchor weighed 3,200 pounds, and not only did the anchor travel over 1.6 miles, the anchor ended up about 10 feet below the surface. How did they even find this anchor when it was 10 feet below the ground? Part of this park is the Memorial Cemetery. It was established not long after the disaster, out of necessity. Texas City didn't have a cemetery, but it needed one set up quickly. This isn't a typical cemetery where each person has a grave marker. This marker notes all those that died in the disaster they could identify. However, there are others buried here that they could not identify. Here's a sculpture installed by the Lions Club in memoriam of all those that lost their lives in the disaster. This looks like a woman in a large jacket in mourning. This marker mentions there was no public cemetery at the time of the disaster so donated funds were used to purchase this two-acre track for the purpose of interring the remains of 63 unidentified people. The sculpture is called Grief. It's kind of hard to read, but the sculpture was dedicated on April 16, 2000, 43 years after the disaster. The sculpture represents how lives have been changed forever due to the disaster, and may those who lost their lives rest in peace. I'm going to walk around this memorial for a few more minutes and just let the camera roll.